First Peter, we're going to be looking at, if I can get the mic situated. First Peter, one, we're going to be looking at verses three through nine, specifically verse three, I think, yeah. Um, and in a little bit, we're going to have a reader come up and share that. And this is the last of Pastor Thomas's three weeks sharing with us. We're so sad. And when he, when he first came in, he said, I could really do a lot of damage. And I'm just like, <laughs> what? It's been great. We've really, um, boy, thank you so much for sharing hope from the word from the series. This has been great. And I hope it's blessed you like it's blessed me. And uh, boy, we're just glad to have you one last time. So thank you so much. Let's give our, our Pastor Thomas Ramundo a warm, warm welcome for his last week. Well, it is true, when Pastor Keith asked me to take these three Sundays while he's on vacation, I did, I did warn him that I could do a lot of damage in three weeks, uh, but you've been very kind and charitable, and I've enjoyed sharing with you. You know, throughout my life, I have been blessed and benefited by some wonderful pastors, professors, and preachers, uh, and I count Pastor Keith among those, and... Uh, and so I am honored that he would trust me with his pulpit and his people uh, while he's uh, uh, on vacation. And it has been my privilege these three weeks to share with you a mini-series that I've called Hope from the Word. Uh, and before I share the third and final message, I think it would be helpful for me to define what I mean by hope, especially in light of what I, I know I'm going to be covering I think it's important to keep in mind the difference between the world's hope and the word's hope. When the word, when scripture speaks of hope, the kind God gives, the hope the believer has, it's talking about what I call capital letter hope. The world's hope is small letter hope. Um, small letter hope. It's a, it's a Disney-esque, wish upon a star, magic Pixie dust, wishful thinking, blind optimism, don't be hopey, you conjure up and talk yourself into. It's what people are talking about when they tell you to just hope for the best. That's small letter hope. But then there's hope in all capital letters, lit up with neon lights and star spangles and banners flashing all around it. Capital letter hope is what the Bible's talking about. Real hope, confident certainty, grounded in God hope. You see, small letter hope is a verb, something you do. Capital letter hope is a noun, something you have. And it's grounded in the Father, gained through the Son, and given by the Spirit. Small letter hope is just hope in hope. Capital letter hope is hope in God. I mean, why wish upon a star when you can have hope in the one who created the stars? So with that in mind, uh, Zach comes to share our scripture lesson with us. Please stand as you're able for the reading of God's word. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is God's word. You may be seated. Thank you very much, Zach. Before I preach, I'd like to pray. Bow your heads, please. 
Lord, I hold in my hand the Holy Bible, the living word, your very truth to us. What the psalmist calls a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. I pray that you would speak to me and through me as I endeavor to share from it now with these good folks. As we study it together, please guide, guard, and govern every word from my mouth and every thought of our hearts, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Folks, friends, the conviction contention and conclusion I have on my mind and hold in my heart as I stand before you this morning is that the world needs Hillsdale Free Methodist Church. And I want to tell you why I fully, firmly, and fervently feel that way. The world needs Hillsdale Free Methodist Church. Why? Well, because the world is lost, and you know the way. The world is confused, and you know the truth. The world is dark, and you have the light. The world is dying, and you have the life. The world is sick with sin, and you have the cure in Christ. The world is a troubling place, and you offer a transforming peace. The world is joyless, and you have Jesus. The world is full of hurting people, and this church is full of caring people. The world is hopeless, and you are hopeful. And I know all these things are true, for I know you fairly well, I think, and I know your pastor. And I know what gets emphasized and celebrated and proclaimed in and through this place. So I'm talking today about the hope you have, hold on to, and hold out to others. Here's hope from the Word, the, the Word of God. This one verse, 1 Peter 1.3, 1 Peter 1.3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Powerful. Uh, hear it again, this time from a bit of a paraphrase. We raise our praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his amazing mercy, we are born again and have hope that's alive to the fingertips through the mighty resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if you'll find this interesting or not, but this morning I am preaching the 6,000th, 22nd sermon of my career. Believe it or not, I've kept a running total since that first message at my first church 48 years ago, and this is the 6,000th, 22nd time I've preached. And I would have to say that of today's 6,021 predecessors on just about every subject, scripture, setting, under the sun, the most relevant topic I ever preach on is the one I preach on this morning, hope, H O. P -E, hope. More than anything else, people need hope. Internal hope, eternal hope. People need hope. And I love being a herald of hope. I, I'm what you could call a hope dealer. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's my job to get people hooked on hope. And whether you know this hope, need this hope, Know someone who does or once knew it and have let it slip away. I'm talking to you today. The author of our verse, Peter, is sometimes called the Apostle of Hope. And this book of the Bible, the Epistle of Hope. So I want to share with you from our verse three dynamic truths about God's gracious and audacious hope that enables us to live a hope-filled, hopeful life. And the first one is this. A merciful father makes hope available. A merciful father makes hope available. Propelled by praise, Peter proclaims that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of his great mercy, gives us new birth into a living hope. Yes, a merciful father makes hope available. Hope, living hope, and it's a good thing. After all, this world can be a pretty hopeless place, can't it? A rough, tough place. 
Why, there's sin, evil, and, and social upheaval. Bad stuff happens. Nature runs amok from famines and floods to typhoons and tornadoes and hurricanes that harass. And people do awful things. Abuse abounds. Dysfunction destroys. Violence victimizes. War wages. Why, there's tyranny and tragedy, poverty and perversity. Our children aren't even safe in their own schools, for Pete's sake. This world can be a terrible place, awful place, painful place, cold and cruel. And the darkness, the darkness seeps and creeps into people's lives, filling them with stress and distress, loneliness and emptiness, weariness and woundedness, fearfulness and brokenness, sadness and, and, and sickness and sinfulness. It's no wonder we live in what is in many ways a hopeless world full of hope-hungry people. Maybe you know some of them. Maybe you are one of them. Folks who feel hapless, helpless, and hopeless. People who feel beat up, shot down, and knocked out by life. Indeed, there seems to be an epidemic of despair and hopelessness out there. Uh, a few years back, I was on a plane to the southwest, Arizona. Uh, I was going out there to speak at a, at a summertime uh, Bible conference, and it was, just, it was the most horrible flight I have ever been on. For whatever reason, we had a rough flight ending with a horrendous landing. And I mean, we hit the runway, bounced, slid and skid, people screamed, and finally we mercifully lurched to a halt at the gate. And, and as, we, um, as we were disem, uh, disembarking, First thought that came to my mind was disemboweling, but <laughs> as we were disembarking, I found myself behind this elderly lady propped up on a cane, just sort of inching along. And as I looked up, I noticed that the pilot, I mean the head guy, the captain, had come out of the front of the plane and was standing at the doorway, uh, shaking hands with people and uh, trying to make up, I guess, for everything that had happened in the awful flight and landing. And, uh, you know, he's saying, thank you, thank you for flying with us, thank you. Sorry about the rough flight, thank you for, hope you'll give us another chance, yes, thank you for flying with us. And finally, as, as this lady in front of me inched up towards him, before he could say a word to her, she looked at him and snapped, young man, I just want to know one thing. Did we land or were we shot down? <laughs> <laughs> You know, in this life, folks feel shut down for any number of reasons in any number of areas. Finances, family, work, health, relationships, the mess our world is in with all the trouble and terror, strife and struggle, worry and woe, violence and vitriol. Ever heard the country song with the lengthy title, I went back to my fourth wife for the third time and gave her a second chance to make a first-class fool out of me. <laughs> Someone's feeling shot down there, feeling pretty hopeless. It happens. One day someone came into my office and told me their life felt like a soap opera. I said, oh, come on, it can't be that bad. But after they laid out what was going on, I had to agree. Their life was like a soap opera. I mean, it happens to people. Uh, as the world turns, <laughs> even the bold and the beautiful, with only one life to live, can feel young and restless and on the edge of night and in their search for tomorrow in need of the guiding light. A soap opera. A few years ago, a, a couple a little younger than us moved into the house next door. I had a few nice chats out in the yard with the husband, a commercial pilot. When I told him my grandson Bailey was interested in flying and the two of us built model airplanes together, he gave me a set of those wings pilot have on their uniforms to give to Bailey. 
I told Noni, I really like this guy. He's pretty cool. He's going to be a great neighbor. A few weeks after they moved in, and just a couple weeks before Christmas, they accepted our invitation to come over one evening, and we had a great time together. She was charming, he was engaging, and then, just a couple days after Christmas, he took a gun and blew his brains out. Right next door. Killed himself. How hopeless do you have to be to do that? What kind of desperate despair drives someone to that? Do you know that out of 100 average Americans, seven, seven of your neighbors struggle with depression, some considering suicide? Seven abuse or are addicted to drugs or alcohol. Fourteen feel crippled or trapped by fear and anxiety. Eight struggle with the loss of a job. Three grieve the death of a loved one. And 60, 60, 60 have no relationship with the Lord at all. No assurance of pardon for sin, peace with God, and the hope of a home in heaven. There's a lot of hopelessness out there, folks. People overwhelmed with fears and overcome with tears where the past is haunting and the future is daunting, feeling like a dope without an ounce of hope. Maybe you know someone like that. Maybe you are someone like that. But a, a merciful father makes hope available. Remember the story of the prodigal son? Jesus told it to illustrate how merciful God the Father is. The youngest of two sons takes his share of the family fortune, heads off to Las Vegas, blows all his money on pot parties and prostitutes, and ends up working for a hog farmer feeding pigs. Feeling helpless and hopeless, he heads back home determined to confess his sins and beg for mercy. Admitting to his father what a selfish, foolish fellow he's been. Well, well here, let, let me tell you the story, perhaps from a little bit of a different version than you've ever heard it before. It goes like this. Feeling footloose and frisky, a foolish, feather-brained fellow forced his fond father to fork over the farthings and fled to far foreign fields and frittered his fantastic fortune, feasting fabulously with faithless, phony, fickle friends. <laughs> Fleeced by his fellows in folly and facing famine, he found himself a feed flinger in a filthy farmyard. Fairly famishing and finally feigning, he fain would have filled his frame with forged food from fodder fragments. Fooey! My father's flunkies fare far finer, the frazzled fugitive forlornly fumbled, frankly facing facts. Frustrated by failure and filled with foreboding, he fled forthwith to his family. Falling at his father's feet, he forlornly fumbled, Father, I've flunked, failed, and fruitlessly forfeited family favor and fellowship. The far-sighted father Forstalling further, fl flinching, frantically flagged the flunkies to fetch a fatling from the flock and fix a feast. <laughs> the fugitive's fault-finding brother frowned ferociously on fickle forgiveness of former fool and falderall. But the faithful father figured filial fidelity is fondly fine, but the fugitive is finally found. What forbids fervent festivity? Let flags be unfurled. Let fanfares flare. And the Father's forgiveness form the foundation for the former fugitive's future fortitude. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> but in Jesus' telling of the story, he lets us know that as the prodigal's returning from the far country and is barely in sight of home, his dad, who's been watching and waiting all the time, sees him coming and with pounding heart and racing feet rushes to meet him, wraps him in a welcoming embrace and covers him with kisses and mercy. Maybe you know someone who needs the welcoming, hope-giving embrace of the Heavenly Father. Maybe you are someone who needs that. Well, there's more. For not only does Peter tell us a merciful father makes hope available, he also tells us a risen son makes hope attainable. 
That's our second dynamic truth from this verse we're looking at. A risen son makes hope attainable. Peter is clear in our verse. This hope comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins. Look at his body, crucified and carted from cross to crypt. What would it take to bring him back to life? How many volts and jolts of electricity? How many megatons of nuclear energy? Why, why you say it? It can't be done. No, it can't. But God did it. And his same power that enabled Christ to defeat death enables us to defeat what's defeating us in life. I mean to tell you, resilient resurrection resources are released for the receptive, giving them pardon for sin, peace with God, purpose for living, power to live it, and a place in paradise. Hope for now and forever. I'll bet you know someone who needs news like that. Maybe you are someone who needs news like that. Listen, isn't that what Paul's talking about in Romans 8, 11, when he says the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in the one who knows him? The same Holy Spirit of Almighty God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in us and gives to us resurrection, life, power, help, and hope. Here, let me try to explain what that means with the help of this. One early November night a few years ago, a Sunday evening in fact, Noni and I got home from a full day of ministry just in time to catch what was for us the trifecta of our favorite sports on television. The end of an NFL game, the final game of the World Series, and sandwiched in between, we saw the last several miles of the New York City Marathon. 50,000 runners. But of course, the cameras were trained on the lead pack of world-class runners led by a couple Kenyans clicking off those 26.2 miles at a pace around four and one-half minutes a mile. Unbelievable. So the next morning, I got up early to set out on my regular run. And freshly inspired from watching the race the night before, I ran just like them, or so it seemed to me. Uh, boy, was I ever good. With smooth and airy gait, I bobbed up, down, up, down, with fine form and magnificent grace, gliding along at four minutes, 30 seconds a mile. I, I could hear the crowd cheering, see the guy with a camera on the back of a motorcycle right in front of me, filming me at my blistering pace. I could anticipate the interviews at the finish line and the coverage on ESPN. It was glorious. I was absolutely amazing. Then at breakfast, Noni said, as she always does, So, uh, how was your run this morning? Incredible, I told her. Uh, I beat two Kenyans, an Ethiopian, some guy from California, and set a new world record. Without even looking up, she yawned, took a sip of coffee, and said, good for you. <laughs> well, I did. I mean, sort of. In my mind, I did. Of course, the truth is, I could never run like those guys. I could talk to them. I could ask them how they do it. I could have them coach me. I could get out there and try to imitate them. But at the end of the day, I'm still going to grind out those miserable miles of mine while 10-year-olds pass me in races. <laughs> but if one of those great runners could just get inside me, filling me with his heart, his ability, his strength and power, why then I'd be ready for the Olympics. But it doesn't work that way, does it? Well, maybe not in running, but in life, that's exactly how it can work where and when the risen, living Lord Jesus Christ is welcome to live in and through a person. Yes, Jesus is a good example, but he's more than that. He's not just a pattern for living. He's the power for living. He's not just an encourager. He's an enabler. 
He's not just a mentor and model. He's a mover and motivator. He's the God and guide running with us and within us. He wants to work for you and through you. He's all you need and gives you what you need start to finish. He saves you, sustains you, strengthens you, shows you how and sees you through. He not only gives resurrection hope to you, he lives resurrection hope through you from the inside out. Maybe you know someone who needs the kind of living hope only a death defeater like Jesus can give. Maybe you are someone who needs that kind of living hope. But there's, there's one more thing I need to tell you about. For not only is it true a merciful father makes hope available, and a risen son makes hope attainable, a new birth makes hope accessible. The new birth. That, that's how you get the kind of hope I've been talking about. That's what Peter says in our verse. It's through a new birth, by being born again. You know, a man came to Jesus late one night. His name was Nicodemus. I, I call that story Nick at night. <laughs> Nick, Nicodemus, Nicodemus had a heavy heart and a questioning mind, and Jesus told him he needed to be born again. <laughs> Whoa, Nick responded. Where are you going with that, Jesus? Surely an old man like me can't go back into his mother's womb and be born a second time. He must have charmed Jesus right out of his sandals with that comeback. And, and I can just see Jesus' gentle grin as he explained he's talking about something spiritual, a supernatural wonder, a miracle God works in the heart for the one who believes him and receives him, a miracle that leads to new life, life that's forgiven. Life that's full, life that's fortified, life that's forever, a life of real hope. You may know someone who needs that. You may be someone who needs that. From time to time, it happens in a pastor's home. Middle of the night, phone rings. You start to reach for it, but pause a second to collect yourself, knowing this might not be good. And then you answer. And one night I answered to find on the other end a teenage girl. She said she had visited my church a few times, but always snuck in late at the start and escaped quickly at the end so she didn't have to talk to anybody. So we'd never met. But she said she liked to listen to what I had to say. She said she was calling because her life was hopeless. She said she was ready to kill herself. She said she had a gun. From my training, I asked her several diagnostic questions and concluded that this gal meant business. We talked the rest of the night. I listened, counseled, comforted, pointed her to the Lord. Uh, told her he was the only hope for her weakness and woundedness, her brokenness and sinfulness. Uh, I asked if we could pray for her to know Jesus. She said, yes, we prayed. Daybreak came. The call ended. After that night, I wondered, I mean for years, I wondered what had become of that young lady. Had she done the unthinkable? Or like Nicodemus, had she really come to know Jesus late that night? One evening, I was walking through our local shopping mall. A young woman was coming toward me, pushing a stroller with a young child in it, another child walking at her side. Uh, I said, hi. She beamed back a beautiful smile and returned the greeting, then stopped. Are you Pastor Ramundo? Yes. Do I know you? Do you remember a teenager that called you late one night years ago saying she was going to kill herself? You mean, yes, she said, that was me. We talked for hours and you talked to me about the Lord. We prayed. I meant to get in touch. I started going to church. Sorry, not yours. I eventually met a great guy at church. We got married and have these two children. We love the Lord, are a part of church, serve the Lord, have an awesome life. I have meant to get in touch and thank you. 
That night changed my life. You gave me hope. No, I said, I gave you time. God gave you hope. He's the only one who can. In his great mercy, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, God the Father had given her a new birth. Why, she'd been born again into a living hope. After all, as we have seen, a merciful father makes hope available, a risen son makes hope attainable, and a new birth makes hope accessible. Thus, we can be saturated with abiding, abounding hope, the optimism of grace and the grace of optimism, based not on human insight, intelligence, and ingenuity, but on the mercy of the father, the resurrection of the son, and the power of the new birth. Know someone who needs that? Maybe you are someone who needs that.